Well, food is one of the major challenges facing us, uh, not only within the region, but globally. And it's tied together with concerns over water, energy, climate change. Um, these are the things we're going to have to focus on in this new institute that we're developing, the Food Policy Institute. Well, look, the institute itself has, has sort of two roles. First, it's an umbrella organization that captures existing centers within the school and brings together those centers so that they can form nice synergies and new ways of connecting together. There's the Australian Center for Biosecurity and Environmental Economics. There's a Center for Water Economics and Policy. And there's a Center for Climate Change and Climate Change Policy. These three will come together and focus on food. I mean, we've come to the, the realization that food, in fact, can't be disconnected from water, from energy, from climate change, from natural resources, generally speaking. So we're going to bring all that together and uh, focus our energies on thinking and talking about food policy. But the Food Policy Institute also is a, is a standalone institute. It's going to bring together expertise not only within ANU, but throughout the region and the world in terms of issues surrounding food and food policy. You know, a lot of people are already participating, including some, some very important institutional partners throughout the region. We've got a, a group in Vietnam, one in Indonesia, one in the Philippines, in China, in uh, India, all working with us, a um, group of NGOs and other research institutes, all working with us to try and tackle food policy issues within the region. Well, food policy means many things. Um, it, again, it captures everything we would think about in terms of energy, water, climate change, natural resources, and so on. But what it is, of course, is, is what it is, is ways of looking at and thinking about how we guarantee a stable food supply. Um, water, air, food, all crucial, essential for life. We want to make sure, we want to study ways in which we can indeed guarantee that we have an adequate food supply going forward and that there's stability in the provision of food. Inevitably tied, to get tied, tied with issues over poverty, right? Because some of the most poor people in this region, indeed throughout the world, are ones who don't have adequate supplies of food. So food policy is designed to look at basically all of these things, things that we care about in terms of providing an essential and also alleviating poverty and also thinking about development and also looking at what, what policies might be put in place to ensure that we in fact have stable food supplies. I can give you examples of bad food policy. I mean, that's a bit easier. Uh, recently when we had trouble with the uh, supplies of rice around the world, there was a big big spike in the price of rice, um, a lot of countries in this region started to close borders and not trade in rice. They indeed created, created a panic, a speculative run in rice. I was, in, I was working in Hanoi at the time when the price of rice shot up tremendously. It became very expensive. People, people were running to the store to buy rice. The government announced that it was going to restrict and indeed ban exports of rice to the rest of the world. Now this is in the middle of Vietnam in the world's biggest rice factory where there's plenty of rice for everyone. In fact, more than enough to go around. Um, it's an example of bad policy. Uh, the government restricted exports so farmers couldn't sell their rice overseas at very high prices. They lost out on millions and millions of dollars as a result of this policy. And the policy itself just generated a lot of uh, internal hoarding of rice, which was absolutely unnecessary. Um, look, examples of good policy are ones that allow for international trade in food without restrictions on imports and exports. Uh, good food policy is one in which you properly uh, end subsidies on food production. Good food policy is policy that brings together the connections between water, energy, and food and delivers food and these basic needs in a coherent fashion. I mean, demands for water, demands for energy are projected to increase very rapidly. And this, of course, affects the food system. Um, so those are going to be issues. There's, a, there's another thing that we should mention. I mean, a lot of climate change policy sometimes comes into conflict with food policy. And that's why in this institute we want to bring all of these various component parts together. Let me give you the example. There's a, there's a big move now in the United States, and there has been for five or six years, to use food for energy. 
what's called biofuels, turning in soy and other kinds of things into food energy. Well, all this did, of course, is increase the price of, of, of food, which probably counterproductive, but moreover, also increased the extraction of oil reserves. Now, here's a funny paradox. It's called a green paradox. Right? When, the, when the government subsidizes biofuel product production, it changes the price of oil, and it causes oil producers to extract more in response. So indeed, the whole push to decrease CO2 emissions by moving the energy system away from oil into food-related products, in fact, generates increases in oil extraction and increases in CO2. Isn't that, isn't that a funny thing, though, right? It's a funny thing. I mean, it sounds like a right idea. It sounds like a good idea. Let's use less oil from the Middle East. Think of yourself as a US citizen. Let's use all of this corn and soybeans that we grow and turn it into ethanol and use that as a source of energy. It has a benefit in the sense that we use less oil, so less CO2 from oil. And indeed, we use our own homegrown products. The, the effect is to increase the price of food dramatically, which of course affects people on poor, you know, poor people, people on low incomes in particular, disproportionately so. But indeed, given the change in the price of oil as a result of using less oil, it causes oil producers to extract faster. So in fact, the increase, you increase the use of oil around the world and you generate more CO2 than you would without the policy. It's anti-green. It's a green paradox. That's how bad food, food policy can generate bad outcomes. Shouldn't be using food for energy. It's simple. Certain kinds of algae, certain things that we don't eat, fine. But not basic food. Shouldn't be used for energy. What you should be looking are biofuels that don't take literally food out of the system, things that normally we wouldn't eat. Although there are problems there as well. I mean, the amount of resources that go into algae farming and things that might be used for biofuel extraction, indeed, not clear that that's cost efficient either. That needs to be looked at more carefully. Well, again, it's an umbrella organization around the centers that already exist in the school. That, that itself is a good thing because instead of, of biosecurity and water and climate change working in isolation, we can now work together on issues surrounding food policy, and that's important. But moreover, the, the, the real benefit is to connect up with our partners in the region to form good food policy. Now, that means bringing, bringing in students. That means education, that means executive education, that means a stream of research designed to inform individuals about and, and governments about what good food policy is. I mean, that, that's what really excites me. Uh, we're, we're reaching into the region and getting all that expertise and bringing it together through this FPI, through the Food Policy Institute, to make a difference.